This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is a special and the madness edition of City Talk. December 14, 2012, Sandy Hook Elementary School, Newtown, Connecticut. 26 dead, 20 kids, 6 teachers. Another slaughter of the innocents. The latest horrific act of carnage by crazies armed with guns. The roll call is reminiscent of Civil War or World War II battlefields. Columbine, Binghamton, Tucson, Sikh Temple, Oregon Mall, Aurora, and on and on. Despite its horror, Sandy Hook is only the second deadliest mass murder by gunfire in U.S. history. On April 16, 2007, Cho Sung Wee executed 32 students and teachers and wounded 17 more at Virginia Tech. Colin Goddard was one of those survivors. Today, with three bullets still in his body, he is a spokesman for the Brady campaign against gun violence and is a force in the U.S. gun sanity movement. Colin Goddard considers himself living for the 32, the 32 killed by Cho, and the title of the film produced by Maria Cuomo Cole and directed by Kevin Breslin, which will be airing for the next 40 minutes. The film was elected for the Sundance Film Festival and shortlisted for an Academy Award. After the film, we will be joined by Jeremy Travis, president of the John Jay College of Criminal Justice here at CUNY, to discuss gun violence, the regulation of weapons of mass murder. He'll also offer some modest proposals. Bonjour, madame. Okay, let me give you a bit more details on that incident that I mentioned before. This is from the Virginia Tech website. Those of you unable to uh, look at it, listen in. A shooting incident occurred at West Ambler Johnston earlier this morning. Police are on the scene and are investigating. The university community is urged to be cautious. If you observe anything suspicious or have information on the case, please contact Virginia Tech Police 231-6411 if you see anything suspicious uh, and uh, I've also just heard it's not been confirmed though that uh, Burris has gone into lockdown and indeed has the vet school so um, just uh, stay out of trouble and uh, keep listening to the radio and I'll keep you updated.
We have new information to release concerning the ongoing investigation into Monday's fatal shootings. We have been able to confirm the identity of the gunman at Norris Hall. That person is Cho Song Hui. He was a 23-year-old South Korean here in the U.S. as a resident alien. Cho was enrolled as an undergraduate student in his senior year as an English major at Virginia Tech. Cho was in the U.S. with a residence established in Centerville, Virginia and was living on campus in Harper Hall. A 9mm handgun and a .22 caliber handgun were recovered from Norris Hall. My name is Colin Goddard. I'm 23. Went to Virginia Tech in 2003 as an Army ROTC student and physics major. And after two years, I withdrew from both programs and became an international studies major. In my second semester French class at Virginia Tech, I found myself on April 16th sitting in class. And that's when my whole life changed. My classroom was somewhere right about here. My brother classrooms down that way. It all looks so different now though. It looks really good. I laid somewhere about here for a while too. And then they brought me out that door. It's crazy being back here. I was in the right place at the right time. I was in class. We started first hearing loud banging noises coming outside of our classroom. Uh, the teacher went to the door to look into the hallway to see what was going on and making all that noise. And as soon as she opened it, she shut it back again and said, everyone get underneath your desk and somebody call 911. I pulled out my phone and dialed 911. And I said that we were in Norris Hall. There's, I think there's a shooting going on. And as soon as I basically got that out, we saw bullets coming through our door. Everyone jumped underneath their desk and went to the floor. You're seeing uh, police out with their weapons drawn, students out looking, trying to see what's going on, running out of buildings. All the major doors to our building were chained shut from the inside, and they had a sign on them that says, if you open this door, we'll explode. I came full circle with the situation when I was shot the first time in my left knee. Sure enough, you feel that sensation of a huge push and a sharp sting, and you feel the blood kind of trickle down your leg and you feel it kind of warm on your body. And then the bangs just got much louder again. You could tell he was back in our room. This time he more methodically came down each of the rows and was still firing. At one point he was standing at my feet and that's when I was shot a second time in my left hip. Some gunshots. Whoa! He shot me the third time in my right shoulder and then it flipped my whole body around and I exposed my right side and I was shot for a fourth time in my right hip. It seems that I only remember a couple more gunshots after that and then everything got quiet. Just as it all started, it all just stopped. It just felt like an eternity before the police got to our door and tried to open it up and couldn't open the door. They had to ask for help from the inside to help them open the door because there were bodies in the way. As soon as the police came into the room, they said, shoot her down. And that's when I was like, shoot her down? What? I didn't know that he had committed suicide in the front of our classroom. Soon after that, the police and the medic staff came in and began their triage of all the students laying on the floor. And I remember hearing them walk up to people, say, this person's yellow, this person's red. And then I heard black tag, black tag, black tag. And that's when I realized that there were other students in here who didn't make it. That year, that was the last day it snowed in Blacksburg. So I remember they laid me on the grass, they cut my shirt off, they cut my jeans off, and um, I was laying there in my underwear, freezing. They hopped an ambulance over the curb and drove right up to me and put me in it, and uh, that's when I started my trip to the hospital. It's a funny story. So Colin picked me up that morning. He drove me to school, and I forgot this later, but he told me that we had considered skipping class to get breakfast because, I mean, it was a 9... 9 a.m. I believe 9:30 French class, and so it was you know it was kind of like we would skip and whatever. I was shot twice in the back and once in my toe. You were shot? 
I was in and out. I was um, unconscious and I remember feeling very cold. Um, the way I was sitting, I was kind of hunched over a chair facing the wall. And he shot me in the back, so eventually I just I couldn't move. I had to reposition myself. And Colin told me not to move because we didn't know what was happening. We didn't know the shooter was had committed suicide. And when I laid down, he grabbed my hand and I just felt very cold. And I had never felt so just tired. I remember in the beginning, they couldn't even tell us how many times he'd been shot. They counted five holes and they didn't know how many bullets there were. The doctors down there didn't treat a lot of gunshot victims. It was a quiet town. And they didn't know if they were entry holes or exit holes. It took a while. First they told us he was shot twice, then they showed us he was shot three times. And it wasn't that they weren't treating the wounds, they just didn't know that they were exit or entry wounds. And finally it came down with four, sh um, four shots, only five holes. So the three bullets never came out. I think a mother always remembers the first time her child, who they think is perfect, gets a scar, their first permanent scar. When you were four years old, you remember in preschool, you fell and you, you still got her. that scar yeah. on your forehead. And I was like, oh no, my perfect baby has a scar. It's never gonna go away. I never thought 15 or 20 years later, you would have different kind of scars altogether. Colin Goddard is recovering with his family by his side, his parents Anne and Andrew and little sister Emma. I know it's a hard morning, especially today for you, Colin, because I'm understanding that you're in some pain, so thank you for joining us to talk to us. I understand that you were hit three times in the shoulder, in the buttocks, and also in the leg, and that they put a, a steel rod uh, in, to help you stand and walk, and that you actually stood on your own yesterday, and you want to run soon? Is that what I'm hearing? Am I hearing this right? Well, I want to have the quickest recovery that I can, so, you know, whatever I got to do to do that, I'll do it. Um, how are you doing and what do you need to get, to get better from this emotionally? The best way, I think, would be to, to just return to the community, return to my friends, return to my daily routine, and, and try to just grind it out through then, and, uh, and then try to get it as much back to normal as I can. Yeah, I was 17 when I first came here. I'm 24. Damn. I was a little cadet running around there with my uniform, getting yelled at by upperclassmen. I was one of seven students to survive out of a class of 17. Uh, my teacher was killed, and there were some students in my class who went there that day. Um, I don't know why. I know that there were people who were killed all around me that did nothing different than I did, and um, I just got lucky. People tell me that God was looking out for me that day. That's why I'm here. Um, I don't know how much of that I can, I can take in. I mean, like I said, I did nothing different than people lying next to me. You know, God was looking out for them too, I'm sure. People were very surprised that I came back to the school, but in my mind, there was no other choice. I had to finish it out here. This will always be a special place for me. Home of the Hokies. When people see stuff on the TV, it's, it's sanitized. I thought if I heard the real cell phone call, the actual cell phone call, it would probably be not as bad as I was imagining. You know, I built it up into a thing in my head. I, I, I don't know, it could have been her absolutely horrific. I imagined the, the, the sound of the shooting. I imagined the sound of people around being shot. When the, the sound came on, we went straight into shooting. And it was, it, was, it, it was chilling. I mean, it, was re it, just, it just came at you like a wave. And I think if people had the idea of the pain and the, 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 the terror, you know, the, the sound of people's voices when they're, they're under, th under fire, people would start to think about things a little differently. Physical therapy was all that I did for about two months. I had physical therapy every day. I remember they put me on a bike and I couldn't make a full rotation on a bike pedal. And that was the goal was to, you know, you had you set small goals, incremental small goals to get, you know, the mobility and everything back. 
it was important for me because I was such an athletic person that I had to get back to being able to do what I did before. I did an interview during those early days. I said, um, I didn't want this to be the defining moment of your life. I didn't want him to be the kid who got shot at Virginia Tech. There's three ways that I've seen that people kind of react to something like this. The first is they completely deny it. The second way is probably that they admit it, but also don't want it to have any effect on their future life, and they go on. And the third person can internalize it, turn it around, and put it towards their future to kind of make something come out of that. And that's a survivor's mission. It's usually something that happened to you was so dramatic and so powerful and so life-changing to you that you have to do something about it. You have to somehow you can't walk away from it. As Song Hee Cho methodically made his way through Norris Hall, law enforcement officials tell CBS News he fired between 175 and 225 bullets. The nation's leading gun control group has charged neither the 22 or 9 millimeter should have ever made it into Cho's hands. According to the FBI, once a person is disqualified, adjudicated, or judged by a court to be mentally defective, he or she is prohibited for life from owning a gun. The Brady Center says Cho met the legal definition when a special court appointed justice checked this box and signed this order, declaring Cho presents an imminent danger to himself as a result of mental illness. But Virginia State Police tell CBS News Cho was not prohibited from owning a gun because despite declaring Cho a danger to himself, the judge did not commit him against his will to a mental health facility. Instead, Cho was ordered only to undergo outpatient treatment. My name is Colin Goddard. I was uh, one of the few survivors from the Virginia Tech shooting two years ago. As a result of my experience, I've learned a great deal about myself, my community, and my country. And I've learned a lot about a situation in society that links many of us. I've learned that if you're a good citizen, a bad citizen, or not even a citizen of this country, you have the same level of access to guns sold at certain gun shows. How you doing, sir? Come over, we can see your Mahdi Egyptian. I'm looking at that thing. This thing is pretty diesel, dude. Pretty good? Yeah. Expanded stock. 30 round clip. You want 660 for it? Yeah, out the door. You've been to one gun show, you've been to all gun shows. It's pretty much the same. You pay your, I think it was eight bucks entry fee. You know, you walk in, you walk past the guy, he asks you if you have any conceal weapons on you. Uh, you start walking around looking at stuff. And then you keep going and then, you know, every once in a while you'll see a guy that's got, you know, just a couple of guns on the table, doesn't really look that official, uh, doesn't have a computer, doesn't have a phone. You know, you go up to him, you start talking to him and you ask him, you know, what do you got to do to buy this gun that he's got? And he says, you know, sometimes all you need is a license. And sometimes you don't even need that. If you tell him you don't have it, like I told him, you know, he's like, all right, well, that's all right. So this is what we brought today. A gun show in Ohio. With no background check. Uh, no license shown. Not a lot of cash. The private sellers are only required by law to ask for verification that you are over 18 years old or 21 for a handgun and you are a resident of that state. You know, that's important information, but that's not the most critical information that they should know. What we're trying to do is enforce the law that's already on the books, the law that says if you are a felon, if you're mentally ill, you cannot own a gun. This is enforcing that law. I wanted to bring the gun show to people instead of telling people to go to gun shows and look at this themselves. I wanted them to not have to go through all that. Make I it mean. easy for people, put it right there in front of their faces, hang it in front of them on the, on the TV screen and say, look, this is legal, all of this is legal, everything that was done is legal. Do you want it to be legal? Do you think that that makes you safe, that this kind of thing's legal? So this is, is this the exact model of the Glock 19? Yes. This is the exact model that, that Cho used on April 16th, one of the two guns he had. For a civilian to have this gun, it's for one reason, one reason only. This is a, this is a military weapon, and, it's a, and it's, a, uh, it's a police weapon. It's a law enforcement weapon. I don't, I don't see the reasoning for a civilian to have it. 
Source of ammunition, this is the magazine. Holds 15 rounds as you can see. You're gonna insert that in and make sure it's firmly locked in place. Next thing you need to strip around by letting the slide go forward on the pistol. That will strip around out of the magazine into the chamber of the weapon. This is now ready to fire. The idea of hollow point ammunition is in the cone of the projectile is an opening. And the idea is when it hits a target, matter will fill this cone and the bullet will actually spread apart. So by the time you're done, you have, you know, dime, nickel size projectile flying through flesh. Fortunately for me, the, the, the scar that I have on my right shoulder here is not from a hollow point, but it's about that big, you know. But if apparently I was told if it was a hollow point bullet, I'd have the size of my fist coming out here in the back, a hole about that big. Joe knew, what, Joe knew what hollow point tip bullets were because that's what, I mean, he made some himself. He knew that what they were designed to do, you know, they were designed to stop a target and to take it out you know, with fewer shots than, and not travel through walls and not travel into the next person. They were, you know, it's intended to do more damage on a single target. The reason hollow points are used by law enforcement is that we are always concerned about a projectile passing through a target into an innocent bystander on the other side. That would be a solid projectile. But a hollow point projectile, since its initial design is to open and spread, the idea is that it won't go through the initial target, potentially saving lives on the other side. So I can empty this clip in about two and a half, three seconds. 15 rounds, out. The only reason that you want to blast 15 rounds off on this thing, it's, it's kind of like a feeling of power. You feel that power. Boom, 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 boom. You could just keep firing. The gun will go empty. The slide will lock to the rear. You put your magazine in. You're up again. Boom, 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 boom. Slide will lock to the rear again. You eject that magazine, put a new one in. Boom, 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 boom. You can keep slapping the magazines in, keep stripping rounds, and that gun just goes. suffered injuries because of a weakness in the background right. check system. Not only is there a weakness in terms of records going in, there's a, there's a weakness in terms of doing background checks on all sales. That's what the, the, the gun show loophole bill is all about. It's pointing out how weak the laws are, how those weak laws allow dangerous people to get guns, and there are real life consequences to allowing that to happen. The Brady campaign's main legislative priority at the moment is H.R. 2324, closing the gun show loophole. This bill that is currently in Congress will be able to require all sellers at gun shows, both licensed and private, to be held to the same standards, and they're all required to run background checks on everyone who buys from them. Dude, it blows my mind. This is what I've been thinking about doing for the past year. I feel like it's the tip of the iceberg that I'm, you know, just at water level and I'm about to go discover this whole beast underneath that I didn't know before. It's exciting. It's exciting for me. I'm excited to do it. And I hope that my excitement maintains throughout as I learn more. Big day. We've got some important meetings yeah. uh, this afternoon, yeah. and uh, the strategy is pretty clear. Uh, when leadership looks at this issue, I mean, they're looking at, do we have time for this? Uh, can we handle the controversy on this? If we can show them that we have a growing and growing list of uh, co-sponsors, then that puts pressure on them to make sure that hearing gets scheduled and you get a chance to tell the story. You know, I'm young, very naive, I think, to a certain extent, so you know, how, could, how could these guys act differently after, you know, what I, how I lay things out to them. That's what I'm interested in, because obviously I'm not the first one who's had this idea, you know? If, if that was the case, then we wouldn't be talking about this today, but... You can do it. All right. You'll be great. All right. Okay. You know, everything seems so clear in my head, you know, and I want to come in and kick ass, and all of the staff guys, everyone we met today said, this is a good thing, like, this is just a good build. And it's like, when you hear that and you're like, well, damn it, then do it. Like, why are you not doing this? Now just remember, just because it's a story that's old to you, it isn't old to them. To them, it's the first time they've heard it. It's the first time they've talked to somebody who was in that room. And it's real easy for them to be theoretical about what they would have done or what someone else would have done. You were the one that was there. You're the one that can talk about it. Oh, if, you, if you're gonna buy one, but I mean like, if you buy one from a 
an individual. You don't need any paperwork. All of my guns, I've never had any paperwork. Cash and carry, that's it. Mm -hmm. You're allowed to sell your own collection. That's right, that's right. Now, this quote, gun show loophole, I've never seen anybody walking around selling guns. I've never seen anyone walking around selling guns. And 10 minutes later, I go and find someone walking around selling guns and I buy a gun from him. This guy here, you know, this guy could be anyone. There's, there's hundreds of these guys all around gun shows, all around the country. It's, I'm not trying to out this man in particular. I'm trying to show what he says, the transaction that we have, and show it multiple times over and over again to look like it's the same situation. It's the same, you know, lack of standards, lack of check. Like, this is the same easy access to guns that the, we have a problem with. This is my first show that I ever went to right here. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. How much you selling that for? Four. Four? Yeah. You want to look at it? Yeah, please. It comes as is like this? I'm sorry? Comes as is like this? Yeah. Nothing else? Nothing else. Yes, sir. I think you got yourself a deal. I didn't think that changing some laws in Washington was going to happen by me telling my story. I thought it was going to be me getting the data, me showing all this other stuff, but but, but no, it's in fact not like that. In fact, I will have, I will be able to move the ball forward a good bit with my story. And, I'll, and as I learn more, I'll change my strategy, I'll change it up, and I'll do whatever I have to do to get what I want changed, you know? A few specific things change. It's not changing the whole world. It's not getting guns from everyone, man. It's talking about two or three small little things that I think would make America a better place. One of, my, one of my sister's best friends started a Facebook group in direct reaction to Students for Concealed Carry on Campus. It was initially called Students Against Concealed Carry on Campus. And it, just, it was just a Facebook group. But then it, it morphed into something more active, and an actual grassroots movement. I think I'm doing something that my sister would be doing. And not only that, I think it's the right thing to do. Our goal isn't to you know, take away anyone's Second Amendment rights or anything like that, but we realize that students do not have the capabilities to do a policeman's job in a classroom setting. The gun dealer who sold one of the two guns used in the Virginia Tech shootings was on the campus Thursday night. Eric Thompson spoke in support of a campaign to allow concealed weapons on college campuses. It's a controversial topic, especially at Tech. We need the right to defend ourselves and we need it now. We can't be sitting ducks and that's what all college campuses are right now. One of the things that the gun does is it equalizes unequals. My mom told me when I was a young boy, because she was armed, she was never afraid. The fact that we're discussing this argument now at this time of human history, you know, we're going to open up universities to be places where shootouts can happen is absolutely ridiculous. These mass shootings only occur in places where guns aren't allowed. They occur in gun-free zones. Think about it. Columbine, he mentioned, post offices, daycare centers, other schools, universities. Why are we removing my teachers' right to protect themselves and, and the children that are in their care? These school shootings are more than just gun policy issues. These are mental health issues and these are school policy issues. It's not a one-trick pony. You're going to give guns to kids and you're going to not have any problems anymore. Because once that student comes in there with the intention to kill with firearms, he's going to kill somebody. You know, and if you get to that point, you've already lost. And unless you are on the same level, knowing that someone's about to come in and shoot you and you're ready to shoot back, you're at a disadvantage. And what kind of learning environment, what kind of classroom situation is productive, is educational when you have students who are thinking about shooting the person who comes in the door? You know, when the police come into a situation like that, who, how are they going to determine who is the, the good guy and who's the bad guy? You totally rewrite the book on a police response to an active shooter because it's no longer one student alone in a building. It's one student among many who has guns. You ask law enforcement, you ask student administration, you ask faculty, they don't want that. Colleges in Colorado, now 15 of them, allow concealed carry. We don't see irresponsible behavior, no accidental... I mean, there was a girl in my class who was killed in her chair. So if this person was the one with the gun who was still in the chair who was killed, then Cho would have had three guns. You know, you could what if this situation a thousand times. You know, it doesn't get you anywhere. It's people who think that they're going to save the day. So many people who have looked at me and told me, you know, to my face or through emails or through whatever, or through responding to my comments on whatever, that, you know, that if they were there that day with me in my class, they would have saved 
the lives of people around me, man. That almost offends me, the fact that you can so sure tell me what you would do in that situation when, when, I, when I guarantee you, man, you would lose your mind if you were in that thing. The question is, what's so different about a college campus that we can suspend the, self def the need to self-defense on that campus. This is something to deal with the situation at the last possible second. Let's look at the facts of Virginia Tech. We could have prevented Cho from purchasing the guns the way he did. He did it legally. He passed the check because his medical record wasn't in the system. That's a problem. Fortunately, Virginia changed that, and they've updated a lot more of their records, but this is not something that's been done nationally, and it needs to be done. You can't have anything all or nothing in this world, you know? You've got to be in the middle. You've got to have reasonable restrictions, reasonable regulations that come in the middle, that let you have the, have the right to bear arms, to keep and bear arms in your home, and to protect your family. I'm totally for that, man. And, be, and after getting shot and after getting involved with all this stuff, I am more likely to own a gun to protect my family in the future if we live in a bad area. Absolutely. See, it's not that easy. Kids think, and young, and even adults think, because I'm walking in the street with a gun, I'm going to get robbed, and I'm going to protect myself. It's not that easy. The unexpected happens. First son, 17 years old. Yeah. They shot him right there on the step, all because they didn't like how he looked. How he looked at the man. That was the first one at 17. 17 years old. 17. The second one was 28 when he got killed. 13 and a 17-year-old killed him, shot him in the head. We, as mothers and fathers that have lost kids to gun violence, we take it very, very serious when a survivor and their parents get involved to tell their story, say, it actually happened to me. It's serious. It's no joke. We need to work from the bottom all the way to the top. We need to work here in this area, right where all the violence happens, talking to these people, trying to show them a different way of living, trying to show them a different respect for life. Say, look, look what's happened in our lives. You know, listen to us, because this is horrible what we're experiencing here. This is not, this is not the land of the free that we're living in. You know, these people are taking the freedoms for all these young people with guns. We have illegal gun sales every day. So the message that you out here giving to the young people, it's going to save somebody's life. Well, listen, I wanted to tell you, last summer when I worked for Brady the first time, um, I told him about the idea about these gun shows. You heard about these gun shows yes. where people yes. buy guns without yes. background checks? Yes. Well, I was like, listen, we need to go there and we need to, to show. What you looking for? Mac? Yeah, what would you want for that again? 75. And I'm like, that's, that's about my lowest dollar. Yeah, he's 400. They haven't sent me my new driver's license yet, so I just have to attempt. That's all right. Number is fine. Ready? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You'll have to be careful. Yes. You're looking at the what? The, the llama here. The llama. So I've got to You get, paid 300 for the man? I paid 300 for it, so I, you know, I wouldn't mess with it for less than 20 bucks. No tax, no papers, no nothing. I'm a retired school teacher. We are in Texas. Addy. And this is what we bought at two gun shows in Texas. One without showing ID and one with just showing a paper ID. We will now turn these over to the police. Where's the paper ID? That's the paper ID. Look, I signed it. It's, it's authentic. Real it's official. Somebody else. I could have Xeroxed this. <laughs> I could have printed this out on my computer. I could have done it in color on my computer. Actually, we didn't call him by his name for a while. Yeah. We used to just call him the shooter. That's right. Mm. Why? I don't know. Somebody asked me that, but I think it was making him more of a person, and I didn't see him as a person. I saw him as this horribly sick monster. And if you gave him a name, it made him more human, and I couldn't deal with that. So we just didn't call him. We just called him the shooter for a long time before we gave him a name. Do you know what it feels like to be spit on your face and have trash shoved down your throat? Do you know what it feels like to dig your own grave? Do you know what it feels like to have your throat snatched from year to year? Do you know what it feels like to be torched alive? Do you know what it feels like to be humiliated and be impaled, impaled upon on a cross and left to bleed to death for your amusement? You have never felt a single ounce of pain your whole life. You had everything you wanted. Your Mercedes wasn't enough, you brats. 
Your golden necklaces weren't enough, you snobs. Your trust fund wasn't enough. Your vodka and cognac weren't enough. All your debaucheries weren't enough. Those weren't enough to fulfill your hedonistic needs. You had everything. I didn't have to do this. I could have left. I could have fled. But no, I will no longer run. You thought it was one pathetic void light you were extinguishing. Thanks to you, I died, like Jesus Christ, to inspire generations of the weak and the defenseless people. This is it. This is where it all ends. End of the road. What a life it was. So nice. Wow. I mean, when it learned it was Cho, when I learned like his history, like who it was, you know, what it, what he had been involved with before, all that, then it's like, <clears throat> you know, it's it's like it's like it made sense. It's like it's like how could nobody have gotten to this guy beforehand? Like how could no one have, you know, realized what was going on before he had to go out like this? It probably wasn't really to the third day that I was getting coherent about what was happening and. I think by that point they had figured out what the number was, what the numbers were. I mean, I knew it was going to be a lot, you know, just because how many times I heard that gunfire, like it was just constant. So I knew it was going to be a lot of people. So, but it didn't really hit me until you, until it was the, um, until that memorial was built, until they all had those wreaths around the, 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 um, the bugler stand and tech on the on the field. Like all, and when you put, when at that first anniversary, when you had one person stand in front of it for each one, you see all those 32 people line up like that. Like, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people when you see them all standing like that. They originally had 33 stones on that Blacksburg for the ceremony. And then the 33rd was, people were messing with it and it was getting defaced and they finally took it away, which is a good idea. That man didn't die the same way 32 other people died. Like he shouldn't be remembered in the same way, so. While he was a, a victim, I believe, to a certain extent, you don't put him in the same category. Right. I used to think the worst thing that could happen to a parent is to have their child die. But I think the very worst thing to happen to a parent is having their child kill another child. And not one, but 32. Mm -hmm. So I have great empathy for his parents. He was a very sick boy, very sick boy, who should have been treated a long time ago. I'm not very religious. <sighs> this event really hasn't made me any more religious. I'm not really asking for anything or praying for anything in particular, just, just thinking. You know, you experience something like this, it's gonna change what you think. It's gonna change how you look at people. I know this guy wasn't a happy man. He was a tormented guy. You know, happy people don't do stuff like this. So I feel sad for him. It's sad for his family now that will forever be associated with this event, just like I am, just the actions of their son. So now it's it's different. Now it's, you know, it's different. <laughs> such times as this, we look for sources of strength to sustain us. And in this moment of loss, you're finding these sources everywhere around you. These sources of strength are with your loved ones. For many of you, your first instinct was to call home and let your moms and dads know that you were okay. Others took on the terrible duty of calling a relative or a classmate or a colleague who had been wounded or lost. We are alive to the imagination and the possibility we will continue to invent the future through our blood and tears, through all this sadness. We are the Hokies. We will prevail. We will prevail. We will prevail. We are Virginia Tech.
there is no meaning in our tragedy. We didn't ask for this, but unfortunately there are people that don't have a voice anymore. And so it's kind of like, we should speak for them. And so I think that's what Colin has done. I am terrified of how I see things ending in the future. If I want it to end the way it is, it's very exciting, but it also means that there will be a lot that needs to be done and doing that won't be easy, absolutely not. Um, but I am afraid, but I do believe it's the good thing to do. So it's the fight I want to fight and the fight I will fight. I want to see an America where people know that they can change what's going on in their communities. I want to see an America where people aren't worried about getting shot walking down the street or getting shot sitting in French class. I want to see an America where people are safe wherever they go. Thanks, Jeremy, for joining us. A remarkable young man and really a powerful reminder of our ability to forget. What was your reaction to the film? Uh, I, I was deeply, deeply moved by this, really troubled uh, by it, uh, to bring all of us as viewers back to that moment, that horrific oh. um, moment at Virginia Tech. You know, I think we have to pay special tribute to Maria Cuomo Cole for bringing this to our attention. She's a great citizen of New York, homeless issues, veterans issues, and on this issue, to be reminded uh, in the wake of what happened in Newtown that we've been here before. Yeah, that we've it's had really... these national moments where we say, how can we live in a country that allows this to happen, and what what can we do about it? So it was very powerful. And Colin Goddard is obviously a remarkable young man and a real uh, hero. Uh, all of us. What particularly struck me was the gun shows, that it, I could walk in and literally buy an yeah. arsenal. And if there were five of us, we could buy an army's worth of weaponry. And you've been doing this for much of your life. I, when, you know, this Fordham Urban Law Journal, 1991, a modest proposal to end gun running in America. Then you're at NIJ, you know, in the mid-90s when what the Times talked about on Sunday in its editorial, the NRA killed the CDC from investigating the public health impacts of right. gun violence. Right. Talk about the power of the NRA, what's missing from the current scene in terms of our discussions. Go ahead. Well, it's a little sobering, actually, to sit here 20-plus years later uh, after um, the work that a number of us did in the early and mid-1990s uh, and to see how little progress we actually have made on regulating uh, uh, the gun market in America. And so you have to ask yourself, where have we been for 20 years? What's happened? So if you look back, you'd say in the early, mid-1990s, when the Brady Law right. was passed, when the assault weapon ban was passed, when large capacity magazine limits were passed, that really was the height of the, uh, of the power of the gun control movement, looking, looking at this as a political question. And in the intervening 20 years, uh, the NRA has emerged as more powerful than ever. Uh, they've been able to, as you indicated, uh, limit the ability of the federal government to do research on gun violence. 
So we don't know what we should know about gun violence? Right, I mean, and, and also, even if you had data, given the mindset of these folks, they would, call, they would somehow denigrate the activity of social scientists and other investigators. Right. Well, you know, unfortunately, there's a larger sort of mood afoot in the country, which is an anti-science uh, sort of reaction. Uh, we see it in climate change, we see it here in, in gun violence as well. Uh, but the NRA has also uh, the uh, assault weapon ban uh, sunsetted after 10 years. The uh, NRA has limited the uh, ability of law enforcement to investigate the, uh, the origin of gun crimes, guns used in crimes. Uh, the NRA has blocked the appointment of a permanent ATF director. Uh, the NRA has expanded the right to carry firearms in national parks. At the state level, they've enacted the Stand Your Ground legislation. Uh, they've uh, s expanded significantly the, the right to carry uh, legislation across the country. So the last 20 years have been a time when we've seen the, the emergence of, it was strong in 20 years ago, but a, an even stronger NRA, uh, and, uh, and a, a retreat of the uh, gun control uh, advocates and the ability of uh, us as a country to enact uh, sensible gun control legislation. So that leaves the question, what can we do now in, in the wake of Newtown? Right, and, we and have Virginia Tech, I mean, the roll call is long and it will right. not end. Right, right. So uh, uh, I think all of us who are uh, concerned about this issue uh, hope that in the wake of Newtown that one of the things that we can do uh, really to honor the, uh, the memory of those who were, who were killed in, in the Sandy Hook Elementary School, students and teachers, is that we can uh, use this opportunity to do what we frankly should have done all along, which is to uh, enact some uh, controls, some regulatory systems over this market. And what the gun show footage in uh, the uh, Colin Goddard uh, show uh, tells us is that there's a market, unregulated, and any economist will tell you uh, that uh, those who want to uh, take advantage will find their way towards the unregulated portion of a market. Yep. And the best estimates are that 40% of all gun transactions uh, occur in gun shows. So the uh, legislation being uh, supported by the president and uh, by others now in Congress to uh, have a universal background check, uh, that's, that's, a, that's the most important thing that we can do uh, right now, mm -hmm. uh, is to, to create a, a, a system of, of controls over the market so that we don't have a porous market that allows those who want to uh, you know, use guns in crimes or uh, use guns for, uh, for inappropriate purposes, uh, that we have a universal background check. So that's the next generation of uh, gun control legislation that's at the top of anyone's agenda. And uh, there's some hope that it'll pass. 85% of the American people want this to pass. So there's some hope that that'll pass uh, this time. You're sanguine? I am up uh, against, we're all up against a very formidable uh, adversary here. Uh, but uh, the, the Newtown, uh, massacre uh, was so horrific uh, and the reaction to it from President Obama to anybody uh, who cares about uh, uh, our most uh, vulnerable citizens, young children, uh, has been so profound that uh, uh, I think we have to be optimistic. So it's a game changer. Maybe no, the think, zeitgeist has changed a bit, so. but the NRA seems as absolute absolutist and intransigent as ever, and right. as are their supporters, right. both in and out of legislatures, right. both national legislatures and the states. Right. And we also have to remember that another uh, important event in the meantime was the decision of the Supreme Court. Right. In 2008, the Heller decision, right. which uh, interpreted the Second Amendment for the first time to confer uh, an individual right uh, to uh, possess firearms. And that's been seized upon by the NRA as, uh, as giving them license, literally, to have any type of gun at any time for any purpose, which is a misreading of the right. Supreme Court decision. I mean, decision. clearly in the Heller case, even Scalia in the majority decision laid out pretty broad exceptions, and it seems as if what's being proposed now falls within the regulatory power of the feds. But you never know with this court. Well, you don't know with the court, and we have to be careful. The, the, uh, the language that you cited uh, by Justice Scalia was what lawyers call dicta. It was not necessary for the holding, so it's, a, it's, a, it's not a decision of the court on some... Right. Uh, but you know, every constitutional right can be uh, restricted in some ways. Uh, First Amendment right, uh, all rights can be restricted in some ways. So the, the test now is whether the restrictions being enacted by states and, uh, and the federal government will withstand scrutiny. And certainly Scalia, in his decision, said, our decision is, is based on the notion of self-defense. 
it's not based on a notion that, right. that you can have a gun for any purpose. And he does say that clearly felons and the mentally ill, uh, uh, that those regulations, he indicates, would, would uh, withstand scrutiny. And he also indicates in his decision that uh, military-style weapons are not necessarily covered by this right of self-defense. But that's dicta. That's not right. essential to the holding. So this will be tested in the courts, but we should remember that the Second Amendment is not an absolute right, uh, that it can be regulated. And certainly the, the role of the federal government in regulating the interstate market, which is the, uh, the uh, sort of core idea of that 1991 article that I wrote, is that we need to regulate the, the, the market so that we, uh, we know the guns are getting into the hands of people who are legally authorized to own guns right. and not getting into the hands of those who can do harm. And that requires uh, universal background checks. What else? What, uh, what are the modest proposals might stand a chance in the current environment, particularly the governmental environment in Washington? Right. Well, look at what's happened in our own state. Uh, much to his credit, yep. Governor Cuomo seized the moment of Newtown and with bipartisan support uh, secured uh, uh, enactment of legislation uh, that really put New York at the forefront. Among the things that he did uh, was to say that, that our state will no longer uh, allow the possession of assault weapons going forward mm -hmm. and required that those who now own assault weapons register them within a certain amount of time and required that people uh, who are licensed to own firearms renew their license from time to time. All of that is totally reasonable and uh, I think would withstand uh, legal scrutiny. Will, will, it will, it will it withstand political attack and political obstruction? That's the question. I think the, I think the, I think the public is in a different place right okay. now. And, uh, and we see some uh, backing away from the sort of knee-jerk uh, reactions that we've seen in the past on the part of some who are NRA supporters. Uh, Senator Manchin is right. a, the classic example that everybody's pointing to, who clearly is indicating a different point of view. Uh, a lot of uh, Republican members of Congress are saying, well, maybe this is okay. Uh, the NRA has, has remained you know, uh, stalwart, right? right? But they've also shown themselves to be uh, you know, just extreme in ways that I think are, are, uh, are, from their point of view, counterproductive. So I think there's a, there's a moment. And, uh, and universal background checks is, I think, a clear winner. Uh, I think the public support, which is now more than half for uh, banning assault weapons, uh, is also very strong, and that's also been supported by uh, President uh, Obama, as we know. So we may have a moment in time when our federal government can act. States cannot do this alone. This requires a federal regulatory system. Well, you know better than, than, than almost everybody else the, the number of crimes committed by illegal guns in New York is astounding. I mean, what is it, 96% of guns committed in crime come from out of state? Right. So you're, you're a historian of New York uh, politics, so you'll remember the summer of 1990. When, uh, when, Do uh, I remember? Mayor Dinkins had just been elected. Uh, our homicide rate was on its way to its peak. Yep. Uh, the New York Post said, Dave, do something. Yep. Uh, and that's what started a number of us, I was at the police department at the time, looking at this issue of, of gun trafficking. And we found at that time uh, that 90% of the guns used in crimes in New York were purchased outside of New York State. So the best gun control laws of our state and our city, which are very stringent. So were Connecticut's. Would do nothing mm -hmm. to prohibit guns from coming in from out of state. That's why we need a federal response. Right. And that remains true today. So uh, Commissioner Kelly, uh, an op-ed piece uh, in, in the New York Post, uh, just reminded us that 90% of the guns used in crimes in New York come from outside of New York State. Mayor Bloomberg has been a stalwart sort of advocate for this idea that, that the, the, the illegal market that allows guns to be purchased in uh, guns, gun stores uh, outside of uh, New York State and gun shows outside of New York State is allowing criminals to use guns inside our city. And the mayor's putting his money where his mind is on this. Right. I mean, undercover right. stuff. One of the things that struck me about the current situation, we talked about this, this earlier, is that you've got, a, you've got a counter movement, not only counter feeling among the public about many of these issues, but you've got a counter movement. You've got Giffords and Kelly m moving forward. You've got the Brady folks. And then you've got Bloomberg with his immense resources right. and his real commitment with 
the mayor's against illegal right. guns. So, I mean, I think the mayor in some way, there's a, not only is there a moment, but there's a, there may be a movement right. as well. What, what uh, Mayor Bloomberg has done uh, over his time in office has been to create an infrastructure of mayors around the country who are now ready to be activated as a political force at a time when they're needed. Frankly, we need the voice of mayors because they're the ones who, you know, they go to the funerals of the, oh, of the dead cops. Uh -huh. They go to the funerals of the young people who are killed by drive-by shootings. They understand better than anyone else this, this, the importance of a, of, a, of a regulatory scheme that will, that will keep illegal guns uh, from getting into the wrong hands. So the mayor's voice around the country is very important. Uh, and that's what Mayor Bloomberg has been able to, to create. And that, we need that voice right now. It's going to be very uh, effective in the days to come as senators and congressmen are trying to decide how to vote on some of these proposals. And uh, he's activated them. He created the uh, mayors uh, against illegal guns. And uh, it's a very important uh, new reality that's, that is the counterweight uh, to the NRA. Okay, let's, let's, let's turn to John Jay for a moment. We've got, we've got a little bit of time. You folks at Jay and CUNY in general, at the time, right after Virginia Tech, you folks instituted a whole series of initiatives, policies, and programs that would prevent a person who was as mentally unstable as the gunman in Virginia Tech was yeah. from, in a sense, falling through the system. One of the uh, reactions to the Virginia Tech massacre uh, that... Um, is understandable is that folks like you, a professor, folks like me, a college president, look at this and say, that happened on a college campus. The young people killed that day, the 32 killed that day, were college students. They could have been our students. Mm -hmm. So we did what I think any, uh, any, all campuses did around the country, which is to ask ourselves, do we have in place the, the, the procedures, the protocols to decrease the likelihood that that would happen on our campus? our campus, in my case at John Jay. And what's, what's important to remember is that in the Virginia Tech case, although it was not highlighted in the film, was that a number of professors had indicated that there was something wrong with this student, with uh, Cho. Uh, and uh, so the question is, how can that information that comes, uh, is brought to the attention of counselors, coaches, professors, others, about a student who is clearly going off uh, off the rails, how could that information be brought to a place where it's actionable? So uh, at John Jay, we created a committee called Students in Crisis just to look at our protocols, our the legal constraints uh, that we have. How do, how do we act on information? We started uh, educating our faculty about warning signs, about how to, how to you know, he had written poetry that was very troubling. He, he had acted well, out in class. Well, the video on the film is just Right, and a lot of this information is now available uh, on social media, right. exactly. Uh, so we just have a, a group that meets regularly, every week, on uh, students in crisis. Okay. John Jay's response to Sandy Hook. I know the, the, the college is doing a series of events. So right after the, uh, the massacre at uh, Sandy Hook, I sent out a notice to our, our community to say, what should we do uh, as a community to respond? So we have a semester's worth of events, starting with a memorial service February 27th, Ending, ending with a symposium, two-day symposium on gun violence in America with uh, panel sessions on, on uh, emergency response, with poetry readings, with dr dramatic productions, with uh, a special uh, panel on gun control, politics of gun control. So we're devoting a semester's worth of activities. We thought we could do this uh, uniquely in, in the country, and we're doing this in honor of those who are killed. Jeremy, thank you. I uh, thank you for your knowledge, your insights, and your commitment on, on this extraordinarily important issue. And within the next several weeks, month, you have to come back because things are going to ha have happened or not have happened in the meantime. So sure. thanks again. I accept the invitation, and thanks for having me today. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. 
whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.